Hi everyone, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. Today, we're going to be discussing cybersecurity, but actually a very specific thing within the cybersecurity space, that is governance, and how is it that you are bringing cybersecurity to all aspects of your operations. Governance has always been one of the more difficult aspects of cybersecurity, at least in my experience, because it very much involves the human aspect of our organizations, bringing multiple different departments, multiple different personalities, multiple different types of dynamics all together in an effort to solve a common problem, which sounds probably much easier than it actually is in practice. And so to really get at the heart of some of those practical considerations and difficulties, I've invited two new guests to the podcast, Jason Fruze, who is the former Chief Information Security Officer for the Upbound Group, formerly known as the Rena Center, and Michael Priest, who is the Chief Information Security Officer for Globe Life, a large insurance company here in the United States. Jason, Michael, welcome to the podcast. So Jason, maybe I can ask you to get us kicked off. And I think one of the difficulties that practitioners in this space have is trying to make sense of all of the various guidance documents out there, the variable frameworks, and trying to really say like, okay, where do I start from a governance perspective? And if I have all of these various options, how do I try to figure out what is the best one for my organization? So maybe you can start by just describing kind of how to start your governance journey and the various tools that you can rely on in doing so. Oh, that's a great question, Scott. I would say, you know, there's several frameworks out there to choose from, and it can be confusing, I think, for a security leader to say, what should I go with? Should I go with them all or can, you know, is one sufficient? And, and I've seen both of those options used. I think going with all of the frameworks can be a lot of overhead, but some people like to cross-reference all of them. I think what's most important is that you pick a framework, you know, at least one. And the reason for that is it allows you in your governance process, the framework allows you to have a common language to speak to other leaders and executives and team members with, to measure your maturity, to measure you know, benchmarking with your peers. And so in that vein of benchmarking with your peers is something you want to take advantage of, then probably one of the most important aspects of picking a framework is picking a framework that's common in your segment, right? So in my former life, the retail space and finance space, the NIST CSF framework is very popular, but there's also ISO and there's ISS. There's other popular frameworks too, but it's good to kind of look around at your peer network and see what frameworks are being used if you plan to use just one for that purpose. Yeah, I think that's right. I think another aspect would be depending on if you're a US-based or international company, I think ISO is more internationally recognized. I'm sure the CSF is gaining ground in that as well, but if you're an international company, that probably matters. I like the parallel you drew in terms of what are you using a framework for? And measurement tends to be a lot of that, especially when you talk, Scott, about the governance and the board reporting, the measurement of not just how are you doing within your peer group, but how are you doing overall and managing risk, that framework is going to be a critical element of being able to assess that level of maturity and communicate the right level of detail to the board. So Mike, it's a really important point that I think you're making, and I just want to maybe dive into it a little bit further. I think, Jason, you mentioned it's important to choose one. And I think, Mike, you're kind of mentioning the ways that can add a lot of value within your organization. Can you go into a little bit more detail there? Why do you think that it is important to have a governance framework? And what are the opportunities and benefits that adding effective governance within your cybersecurity function can have for an organization? I don't think that your leaders want you to rely on expert opinion. So having something that you can say is a structure that everyone's using to guide the program to assess risk and report on how you are addressing different risks and even compliance requirements. This is obviously becoming a very heavily regulated space, both on the cyber and privacy side. So having something that provides that structure and order to be able to address your compliance requirements and show that you are aligning with something standard when you think about the threats and the rest of the organization, I think it's critical to have something that provides that structure and not just say, hey, I'm a security professional, I know about this, so just trust me, Uh, that's that's not gonna cut it. Yeah, and I think on that structure point, right, in my experience, it seems as though there's not a uniform set of structures that apply across all companies and how they organize their cybersecurity functions. 
In both of your experiences, Mike, and I'll start with you, maybe you can describe some of the ways that cyber functions have structured themselves and the role that the cybersecurity function plays within the organization. So I like to think about it in terms of how the senior leaders are looking at it. So cybersecurity is not the business. Cybersecurity supports the business. And when you think about the National Association of Corporate Directors and how they're encouraging board members to look at the problem, it's a business risk issue. And so being able to talk in those terms, just like any other functional risk area of the business, I think is a critical element. So using the frameworks to assess the risk and have those conversations with the executive leaders and the board or even the business line leaders to help them understand where they have areas of risk is critical. Jason, interested in your perspective on that, as Mike was describing that the cybersecurity function is a risk management function, how is that then instilled within the organization? Because obviously organizations have a number of risks, not just cyber, and each one of those risks may be managed by different people and by different departments and in different ways. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. I think the security organization really has to view itself through that lens of saying, we're here to make sure that we have a reliable revenue stream that's free from cyber disruption, right? Cyber being a risk category, and there's many different risk categories, cyber happens to be the one an organization is perhaps most likely to realize. So there's a significant investment in mitigating that risk. But I think it's important for security organizations to recognize that that is the purpose, right? The company doesn't invest in security for the sake of security. They're investing to mitigate the risk of a financial impact, reputational impact, to the revenue stream, to the value stream to the customer. So that's a critical aspect of how we view ourselves and our role in the organization. And cyber here defined broader than just kind of information security, right? This would have a levels of cybersecurity around continuity and the ability of continuing to do business, which can end up being core to the operations of any particular organization. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think beyond just the information security protection, Scott, that you mentioned, a lot of times we think about it in terms of that. A lot of the breaches that I think we see in the news have to do with data loss and customer protection. But if you look at some of the more recent breaches that have happened around ransomware specifically, there's definitely an operational impact. You see that Clorox, when you look at their 8K filing, had a substantial disruption to their supply chain and their sales organization. So while it wasn't necessarily directly a customer impact issue, it's a cybersecurity issue that was disruptive to their business and had a huge financial impact. Yeah, I mean, critical point, right? And I use the word critical maybe intentionally because I'm automatically starting to think about critical infrastructure and the unique kind of components that cybersecurity present to those sectors. And as everybody who is in the space knows, you know, critical infrastructure is defined very broadly, at least by the U.S. government, to cover a number of areas that would be thinking that things would be obvious, like the electricity grid and gas pipelines, but then things that you would think are less obvious, like some of the key components of the financial systems and healthcare systems. So really broad impact and obviously the ability and the availability of those businesses to continue to operate is core to their functioning. And it sounds like from both of your perspectives, governance is one of the key components of that because your role is to be able to take those risks that you're seeing, not only on the security of the information you maintain, but also be able to continue to operate business and then be able to disseminate out that knowledge to others. Is that a fair summary, Jason, of what you were describing? 100%. I think the digital dependence isn't always clear, especially as older organizations go through you know, digital evolution and modernization efforts. Their operations become far more digitally dependent. And so protecting that digital infrastructure is vital. But do the leadership team, or does the leadership team rather, understand that portion of the revenue is purely dependent on digital technology and what is no longer purely manual, right? And some organizations are 100% digitally dependent. You could contrast in a retail space, say an Amazon, who's completely digitally dependent, I would say, versus a Hobby Lobby, which I would say is probably less digitally dependent, but this is speculation on my part. But just to contrast those two things, the computer network could be down, but people can probably still buy stuff in stores. You know, that may not be true for Amazon. Right. So understanding that Mike brought up the great example with Clorox, clearly a heavy digital dependence in their operational capabilities. And that was highlighted by that cyber attack and the operational impacts. So being able to mention that, bring that back to your executive team, 
to you know, make sure that you're getting the resources you need to protect those digital assets is a critical piece of the work of the job. So Jason, I'm interested in your perspectives on strategies that organizations may take as they look to implement a governance function or perhaps maybe strengthen an existing governance option. From your perspective, what do those strategies look like and what are the available options to organizations as they look to implement or enhance their existing governance operations? Great question. Yeah, I guess first I would say governance, what it is, right? All the processes, the roles, the policies that go into the security program to make sure that the information security assets or, or information assets are adequately protected, right? That institutes the governance process. Early on in this emerging CISO role, I think companies had the expectation that they would hire a CISO and they would make risk decisions on behalf of the company. And I think we've seen that that doesn't work. I think it's necessary. Uh, most companies are establishing these steering committees that are comprised of different business leaders at the management level in the company that make risk decisions. And in that capacity, the CISO operates as a consultant to that committee to say, here, we've discovered a risk. Here's the rating of the risk. If it's outside of our risk tolerance or inside of our tolerance and a recommendation for the treatment of that risk, and then the committee is going to make a determination as to whether there's an investment made or not in mitigating that risk or just accepting that risk. I think another critical aspect is that security framework we talked about. I think that committee now gets to look at that framework. They can look at benchmarks to say, how do we stack up against our peers? Are we keeping pace with peers? And how are we doing from a year-over-year maturity perspective? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? So that framework allows you to have that conversation to make sure the investment in security continues to be where it should be. And I think the security policies and standards, which is where the, the interpretation of the risk tolerance takes place, that committee gets to review those policies and standards to say, are we adequately viewing the risk tolerance and setting policies that the organization has to follow at the appropriate level? And then obviously looking at KPIs and KRIs, all those things go into a healthy governance program. What I think you're starting to see is kind of a, a different mindset around the CISO role. I think in the past, it was heavily a technical role. Now, I still advocate for CISOs having a decent amount of technical understanding because even though a lot of this is not technology, it's business risk, you need to understand how the risk is assessed and you have to understand how the threats work. And you're starting to see regulators use language like the CISO is required to have independence. So I think what you're seeing is that there's this desire for, as Jason said, the CISO to be in this consultative role, not in kind of stuck in IT, just being an IT person, but actually being a business leader, a risk manager. And I was introduced to the IAA three lines of defense model about a decade ago. That's the Institute of Internal Auditors. They've changed it since to call it to just the three lines model. And it's really the first line operations folks that are kind of running the tools. Second line is strategy, governance, things of those nature. And then third line is your internal audit. So you have people that are checking that things are being done. You have people that are overseeing the strategy of the program, that governance role. And then you have people that are actually in the day-to-day -day operations of running the controls. And I think that's a great model for setting up governance in a way that provides that independence and allows you to report risks to the business leaders and the board in this way that's not just a, a technology discussion, but a business discussion. It's not somebody from IT coming in and having this conversation about technology. It's somebody in a consultative role talking about business risk. So that's a really interesting point, Mike. And I want to come back to the committee, Jason, that you were describing in a moment. But before doing that, let's focus on that distinction that you're trying to draw for the CISO role as being one of a risk manager, kind of a senior business leader, as opposed to the operational individual. And maybe to round that out a little, let's use an example. Are you saying then that the CISO if we're talking about, I don't know, maybe the business need is to allow for remote access to infrastructure. And, you know, you're thinking about the CISO's role is then thinking about what the security risks are in allowing for that remote access and how, what are the various options are to be able to help mitigate those risks. But then are you also saying that the CISO wouldn't be responsible for choosing the technologies that would address those risks. The CISO role would be around trying to define and set out what the priorities are and the requirements are for somebody else to implement. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a religious subject in the field still. <laughs> That's the way uh, I prefer to approach it, is that I understand the business objective. 
then I look at what they're trying to accomplish and I would say, what are the threats for what you're trying to do? Who's going to try to exploit a weakness there? What are the ways they go about doing that? And then what controls would we want to put in place to protect that business need? And then I can pass that off to our technology leaders and say, hey, we need these. These are business controls for security. These are business requirements. So you have functional business requirements and you have security business requirements. And then, yeah, I wouldn't choose the technology myself, but I would define what the controls are that need to be met. And I think also continuously assess the effectiveness of those controls. So while I may not say that the CISO should be choosing the technology, the CISO's group role should absolutely be assessing if the effectiveness of the technology is keeping the risk mitigated to the appropriate level. It's a partnership for sure. So it's almost like it's a check and balance in place that's going to allow for one person to be able to set what the requirements are and that person to also confirm that those standards are being met without necessarily being invested in the technology that are available to be able to meet those standards. Jason is interested in your perspective on that dynamic, including whether there are other options that you see within the CISO profession where they may end up getting involved more in the day-to-day operations. Well, yeah. So I agree with Mike as that being the superior model. I do think there's a trend that I'm seeing where sometimes the CISO is responsible for infrastructure as well. And that's something that's creeping up more commonly, at least from what I'm seeing. And it's interesting because I like what Mike brought up around that IIA three lines model, where the CISO sits squarely in that second line of defense. And then like IT operations would be the first line or part of the first line. But once you put the CISO over infrastructure, Now the CISO not only has responsibility for the first line, but also the second line. And so they might have a greater stake in selecting technologies, but the fundamental outcome of making sure that the technologies mitigate risk is still there, right? It's still there. They just would have more skin in the game with that particular equation. So let's talk about like skill sets, right? That would be needed to play into this dynamic that you're describing, because I think one of the things that I've had conversations with you in the past has been around that there is a limited talent pool currently within the cybersecurity space, especially at kind of at those higher levels that both of you operate in. And I think the other dynamic interested, if you agree or disagree, is that many of the folks who are in that space you know, came from the operational side of the house, right? In other words, that's where they cut their teeth on cybersecurity. So taking them outside of the role of making those day-to-day operations and choosing technology partners and getting deep into the weeds about exactly how a piece of technology works is a difficult transition, I would think, to then having them now play the role of kind of more out of the weeds, senior business role of providing overall risk mitigation and management for an organization. Yeah, I think it's less of a talent issue and more of, to your point, a desire issue. A lot of times folks that went into IT went into IT because they liked the technology. They liked tinkering. They liked flipping the switches. And so I think getting someone to extract themselves from that really in the weeds day to day working with technology and instead looking at the kind of strategic view of it and really being more of a people centric role. I think it is a challenge to find folks that are really great at cybersecurity that also are okay not really being in the weeds of the technology on a day to day basis. That's an excellent point. And then I want to come back to that point, I think, that Jason was making a moment ago. And Mike, I'd ask you, from your perspective, you know, Jason was describing having a committee of team members within an organization that's going to ultimately make decisions for the organization. And that committee would be advised by the CISO based on the CISO's expertise and the CISO's unique abilities But the CISO not actually making the decisions around a number of those areas. It would be the committee making those decisions. Who do you see as participating in what those committees look like? Who are those stakeholders that you see as really important to be engaged in that type of decision making? So I think it's first to think about the fact that there's only so much work any organization can do. And a lot of things come down to prioritization. So there's a new enhancement that someone in the sales organization might want, and there's something that HR needs in their new platform. And everybody's got these different priorities within the business of what they're trying to accomplish that addresses the strategic objectives of the company. And you have to prioritize what gets done. So I think 
similar committees that you would have for the prioritization of that work should also be involved in making the decisions on where risk gets mitigated, whether it's cybersecurity or any other risk. So oftentimes those decision makers, I think, are your folks like your CFO and maybe your sales leaders and your CIO general counsel has a very important component of this these days. Like I said, this is becoming much more regulated and a legal issue. So those stakeholders, I think, all have to be a part of that discussion in terms of what strategically are we trying to accomplish as a company and where did these risk mitigation activities fit in to accomplish that strategic objective in a way that doesn't cause us to have some sort of a catastrophic event that sets us back instead of allowing us to be propelled forward. And you might think of it in terms of also the new SEC requirement for disclosure. The folks that would really fully understand the complete picture of what might be material are probably similar folks. There's both the qualitative and quantitative factors that we know have to be weighed when determining what's disclosed. There's no one person in the company that's going to be able to say definitively what's material and what's not in a cyber event because it depends on the event that you're experiencing, which is also what makes cybersecurity difficult to risk assess. There are so many different scenarios, so many different types of impacts that you can experience. Leaders across different space are required in all of these conversations. So what I'm taking from what you describe is it sounds like there's not one right answer to saying this person needs to be on, this person needs to be on, but it has to have several criteria. One is it has to have sufficiently senior people involved that are going to be able to be decision makers for the organization, but also have perspective on the totality of the operations using the analogy that you described as for materiality. Second, it needs to be multidisciplinary, right? You'd mentioned the CISO, you mentioned the general counsel, you mentioned the head of sales. There's kind of a variety of people who are not really cybersecurity professionals who are all going to be part of those decision-making groups. And maybe I'm interested, Jason, so if we compose the committee like that, what is it that we're asking them to do in practice? And how is it that that group would have the underlying expertise and information in order for them to effectively make those decisions that are being put to them? That's a great question. And this is the art, right? So it's important for the CISO to be able to talk to a bunch of non-cyber experts about cyber issues. So making it simple and making it business relevant because we're not expecting them to become cyber experts. We're expecting them to become aware of the impact of various cyber risks. And so the CISO has got to articulate that in a way that someone from the finance organization or legal or HR or whoever's on that committee can digest it. So it has to be made accessible, simplified, but it's still impactful. And then again, the, the CISO is an advisor. So here's what I would advise we do to mitigate this risk and make it conversational right, for that committee. It's important, I think, to have a charter that spells out what each role of the or the role of the people on the committee are. And then I guess secondarily, I would say the, the committee needs to understand that it is in effect practically executing on the board's governance role. And so the decisions made in that committee, those go back to the board for feedback, right? So these are the risks that we've accepted. This is what we've mitigated, the decisions that have been made. So there's a constant loop where if the board doesn't agree with the decision that was made on a risk, are there some feedback brought back from the CISO to say, okay, here's the outcome of that conversation. And I think that's a vital part of this being successful as well, is that you have that continuous risk management cycle. Yeah. Let's maybe double click on that risk point, because what's challenging about cybersecurity is trying to get to zero risk is impossible. And, and frankly, not something that an organization can even strive to do. I mean, they can spend every last dollar in their operational budget to be able to buy endless amount of cybersecurity tools and still not get to zero. So that would mean that there is going to be some risk appetite, can't be zero, also probably can't be a significant risk appetite depending on the industry. How is it from your perspective that that is being defined from an organizational perspective? Is that the committee that's involved in this? Is that the CISO kind of bringing their recommendation about how much risk to take? It seems as though in order to get that question right, it really requires really some soul searching within the organization about how is it they would want to manage 
the legal obligations, the regulatory obligations, the customer obligations, the relationships that they want to have with consumers, I mean, all of the above, interested in how that works in practice. Yeah, well, that's a great question. This is a tough one. If you don't already have uh, some definition of risk appetite and risk tolerance in your organization, you know, you have to go through the hard work of, of having the conversations with folks to say, you know, this is how we want to quantify operational impacts and financial impacts, reputational impacts. I thought this was useful. I, was, I heard this once from a colleague. Your risk appetite, right? And this is for folks who like to go into casinos. Yeah, you know, how much money are you willing to lose is your appetite. And then your tolerance is really what are the odds in this particular game? So the odds in blackjack are much better for you than in craps, for example. So do you have a tolerance for losing money at the rate you will at craps, right? Or are you a blackjack player, right? You have less tolerance. But either way, you have the same amount of money at stake, right? It's just how fast you want to win or lose. I thought that was a great analogy. And I, you know, I think that that helps kind of tease out the semantical difference between the two terms. But now that you have that, you have to go talk with that steering committee. I think that conversation for me has always begun with the CFO to say, okay, how do we want to structure this conversation? Then we go to the committee with a recommended statement, right? Because all this is going to distill down to a risk tolerance statement, which becomes an optics for risk decisions. And then once the committee votes on that, that I took directly to the board to say, do you agree with this? Right. Because I think it's critical that the board have awareness of that management decision, but also a consensus with it to say we agree that this is an adequate statement of risk tolerance and, and appetite. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating because the other dynamic there, right? In some ways, it's true. In some ways, it's not true that organizations are free to choose their own risk appetite. Much like if I had to survey a hundred CISOs, all of whom are well credentialed, well experienced. My guess is that, you know, if they started to go through a number of areas, they may end up having different risk appetites. It's just kind of part of the human nature. But at the same time, right, and we've talked a lot about this in prior episodes, looking over your shoulder and ready to second guess any of those risk decisions that you make are plaintiffs, class action lawsuits, regulatory investigations, law enforcement, that's a long list. And so saying we're risk averse or we are risk tolerant or whatever position you're going to take is one that almost also becomes a legal question. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the, to your point, you know, you may have a different risk appetite than if you have a significant other that shares your finances or children who are stakeholders, you, know, you might be willing to bet their college <laughs> But your significant other would not. And so I think that's a great analogy of the conversation that you have to have with all the stakeholders that have to be represented in defining that risk appetite. How much are we willing to bet on this casino trip or this cyber area? And I think that's exactly why the board has to sign off on that because they represent the shareholders, right? So it's critical for the board to say, yeah, that seems correct, right? We agree with that assessment because management could be off, right? It could be off. And it's important that you have that critical board check and legal, to your point, right, legal is there to make sure that the legal implications are represented. You know, what are the compliance costs to non-compliance of various, various legal gaps in our assessment of our tolerance and appetite and so forth? So they've got to be factored in that as well. Mike, interested in your perspective on that, you mentioned like the GC having to be part of that committee as being one of the functions represented. How do you see the overlap between the regulatory environment, the legal environment, and the cybersecurity risk decisions that you're being asked to advise on? So I think if you're going to start to look at a regulated company, it has to go beyond the appetite and start to talk about tolerance. And I think you can have different tolerances in different areas. So if I'm a completely unregulated company, there's some decisions I can make in terms of risk acceptance that wouldn't fly in a regulated company where, to your point, Scott, if you had a lawsuit from plaintiffs, alleging harm for the compromise of their identity and you're not in that type of an organization that has that that aspect that component you can make more true risk-based decisions i think than you can in a regulated industry so i think the the tolerance may be different depending on the type of data the type of situation that you're talking about if you're talking about a database full of customer records you may have very low tolerance 
to go above your appetite. You may say our risk appetite is moderate. My tolerance for anything outside of that is low. But if you're talking about an operational system that has nothing to do with customer data, you would say, well, it's moderate, but given this important timeline we need to meet, we're willing to let the system go unpatched for much longer because the impending harm would be within our tolerance. So I think the appetite and tolerance conversation has to go hand in hand. It's interesting to me, I was thinking about this whole conversation as you guys were talking as well. I kind of smile when I see CISO say things like, I can't get my budget approved. And I I always wonder, it's not really your budget per se, right? It's whatever the business has chosen to do in terms of mitigating risk. If you've done your job to assess risk and bring recommendations to them on what it will take to mitigate that risk and that committee determines what they want to mitigate, that's your budget. That's what you've been assigned to do. That's what the business leaders have chosen as their objectives. And executing on that is now, and executing and reporting on progress against that is what's important. So they're making risk decisions, factoring in a lot of other things that we probably don't see as CISOs in terms of other strategic priorities of the company. I'm not going to have visibility as a CISO into every critical thing that the company is trying to accomplish. It's one voice amongst many voices that are looking at the priorities of the company. Yeah. A similar vein, Jason, you mentioned earlier around kind of the role of the board and and having the board be receiving information and being able to have the role of playing a, a governance function. One area that is in an area that's been perhaps in flux, but an area that's increasingly emphasized by regulators in the kind of areas we're looking for different types of governance functions is how management, how the CISO, how kind of senior management can be able to advise the board or provide the board with relevant information for them to understand what the overall risk is to the organization from a cyber perspective. And that would allow the the board to fulfill its fiduciary responsibilities in providing oversight. Interested in your perspective, having lived that, what are some practices that you think are going well? Where do you see that current dynamic playing out between senior management providing the right amount of information for the board to be able to fulfill its obligations? That's a great question. I think it's important to distinguish between management and governance. I think in that sense, you have to understand your audience. When a CISO is talking to a cybersecurity steering committee, that's a management committee. We're going to determine in that committee how to manage that risk. We're going to use different visuals, different dashboards, different deeper metrics with much more details are going to go into those decisions as we articulate what those risks are and how we should prioritize them. When we're talking to the board, we're no longer talking to business management. Now we're talking just a governance conversation. So we're not saying, hey, here's a recommendation from us as a CISO on what we think we should do. The board is looking for you to tell them what you're going to do. What is the decision that's been made? And you know they can tell you if they disagree with it. And that's not a comfortable conversation, but we're never there to ask the board for a decision on a particular risk. Now, they are advisors. You know, In their governance capacity, the board is going to give advice, but it's different from the way that we ask the management committee, management committees for advice on certain risks and so on. So I think effectively presenting to your board is understanding that you need to dimension and provide confidence to that audience that you have an understanding of the top risks the organization is facing and you're tracking progress towards mitigating those risks. That's critical. And I think the details aren't necessary. It's just showing that you have it, right? So keep it very high level is key to success. And, you know, there's other measures, you know, what are our financial spend? The board wants to make sure that we're being good shepherds of the financial resources dedicated to cyber. So what are we spending on people and technology and so on? And they might be interested in benchmarks depending on the board. Every board's unique, right? So it's important to understand your board. But I think all of those are keys to success in my experience. Yeah, Mike, interested in your perspective on that question, including that one of the dynamics is that where the folks who sit on a number of large companies' boards tend to be more senior individuals who have had past careers and enjoyed a lot of success, but that success was not usually cyber-oriented success. It was areas that they've succeeded in other areas of business or in within their respective professions, and thus having those team members and those board members be the ones to help bring them up to speed about where 
an organization is from a cyber perspective can be difficult just because they're not actually in the weeds and understand that dynamic from their prior dealings. Um, any thoughts about how to present actionable information to that group of senior leaders? Yeah, I think in the purest sense, it's really thinking about what are the key risk indicators. We talk about that in the cybersecurity profession. We're usually thinking about what's a control failure that could result in a malware infection or ransomware event, something along those lines. But if you try to distill that down even further and align it to the business objectives, what the board is really looking for is we know what we want to accomplish as a company. What cyber event could disrupt that? And what areas are we weak and vulnerable to that event? And to Jason's point, what are we doing to address that? Because it's oversight from their perspective. Are we looking at the right things? Are we mitigating the risks? Are we doing it in a timely fashion? And I think it's really a key risk indicator conversation with them. And in terms of the board's knowledge on cyber, I think you're starting to see a push for the board to need to be educated on the topic. NACD, again, in their cyber risk oversight manual specifically calls out that the board needs to have access to education on cybersecurity. And I think NACD partnered with Carnegie Mellon to create specifically a training program for board members to take to, to gain more knowledge. And while the SEC softened their guidance on that the board must have someone with expertise in cyber, they still want you to disclose to what extent you have someone who is kind of knowledgeable in that area and overseeing it. So I think that I'll be interested to see how this evolves from a regulatory perspective to see if boards start to have even more cyber knowledge as a requirement is something that's evaluated as they add new board members. Yeah, that evolution maybe is a great place for us to maybe ask my final question. And I agree with you 100%, Mike, is that what's interesting about this particular space and about cybersecurity and privacy and data protection in general is that it's moving so fast in terms of those standards. And so oftentimes when I'm working with clients and you know, a theme of this podcast is around trying to be resilient to change as much as possible because for each of you and playing the roles that you're asked to play by your organizations, it's one where you cannot be so deep into the weeds on every single matter, in which case you can never think about the big picture. Think about how is it that you are going to create organizational risk management at the level that you need to. And that's always a balance and always a struggle, I think, for each one of us in the space is how to both be involved in the things that are important on a day-to-day perspective while also trying not necessarily to be involved in every decision so that I can be able to make some of those bigger priorities. And I think part of that, in order for us to do that well, at least in my view, is to build out the infrastructure and build out the systems and the processes so that you are expecting that change will happen. You're expecting that there will be new regulations that are going to come into play and they're going to require different things. And so not necessarily to only build your program surrounding what is the requirements today, but be well aware of what the requirements were going to look like next year and the year after that and in five years time so that you are better able to respond without having to redesign everything in the very end. So maybe that's the setup for the question that I have for both of you. If you're thinking about the various governance actions that you would want to take and advise your organizations to take, what are one or two specific actions that you think have a particular high ROI so that they are going to result in a disproportionate value to the organization that will help the organization be more resistant to regulatory change and evolution in the future? It's a great question. If I had to pick two things, I would say, first and foremost, it's important for every CISO to have information gathering networks, You know whether they're getting intel on what's going on through CISO forums or where they're getting it. They need to have a vehicle. I think one of the most important vehicles is also your board, encouraging a two-way conversation, right? Making sure that as you're telling the board, this is what we're seeing and what we're doing, your board members likely do sit on other boards. They are likely going to ask you or, or advise you on what they're seeing out there as well. So that can help you stay ahead of things as well. And I think the other thing I would suggest is doing what you can to get the cyber update out of the audit committee. If you're one of those folks that's in the audit committee, in the audit committee, you're talking to a group of people who are dealing with 
so much. You know, for them to be expected to be cybersecurity experts at, at any level is almost an unreasonable request. You know, creating a cyber committee within the board and an IT committee within the board allows for a lengthier conversation to be more strategic about how you approach you know, your digital dependence and how you're managing the cybersecurity aspects of that. And it gives you more than that 10 minute board update in the audit committee that everyone struggles to make effective. So those would be my two things. You have to have a solid risk assessment process. I don't think you can do the job appropriately without that. And I think it needs to be founded in good data. I think subjective risk assessment is not good enough. Now, we can argue all day in the industry about quantitative risk analysis and the utility of that, and, and people continue to do so. And, and I, don't, I don't disagree that with us pushing as an industry to try to get more quantitative where we have good data. But regardless of whether it's quantitative, semi-quantitative, it needs to be consistent because that consistency in assessing risk is going to yield consistency in recommendations and I think also be defensible. The regulators have said in many instances that they want us, they want to give us the freedom to be risk managed, to make our own risk decisions. But I think where companies fail to do that in their eyes is where they start to become more prescriptive and what they want. Your DFS regulation, I think, is an example of that, where in the first version, it was fairly prescriptive compared to others. But in the second, in this amendment that's soon to come out, it's even more prescriptive. It's getting very technology specific, which is interesting for sure. But I think having that risk management function well-defined and consistently followed is critical. And then I just think having consistent reporting with the board, set the objectives of it. Here's what you're going to hear about and stick with that, make sure that it's consistent in each update is critical as well, that you're not kind of all over the map and make sure you understand what they understand so that you can communicate it in a way that they understand. Not every board's gonna be the same. Not every cybersecurity function should be structured the same. Every company is gonna have somewhat of a unique personality in how they manage any priority. And so I think you have to really sit down with your executive leadership, with your boards, understand what their objectives are, understand what their level of understanding is, and then tailor your program to make it clear to them how to make good decisions. Great point. Well, with that, I think we're just about out of time. So Jason, Mike, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Really great conversation. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and those are your data points. Mm -hmm.